Hey, and welcome to Winning Conversations. Today is a really fun episode. Andy and I sit down with Miss Carol King. Now, Carol serves the executive team as an intercessor and a prayer. She prays over our staff. Um, she's in some of our meetings in order to get a good idea of where God is taking the church. Now, she hails to us from Calvary Cathedral in Fort Worth. She was there for 18 plus years leading prayer. She is anointed in the area of prayer and intercession. So if you have any interest in going higher in your prayer life, this is for sure the episode you're going to want to listen to. It's a really great conversation. We really hope you enjoy it. Let's jump right in. Well, hi, Miss Carol. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Andy and I are super glad to have you here today. It's fun to be here too. Some girl time. So yes. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people know you. I feel like you're kind of like a sleeper. Like no one really knows what you what you do and what you serve at church. So um, you are one of our main intercessors. And will you explain what pastors ask you to do with serving the executive team? Uh, it's a, a place of prayer among the administrative team to uh, just be sensitive to the needs, whether it's a natural need or a spiritual need, and then take those to uh, the throne and pray through it. Okay. How long have you been in that role? It'll be two years sometime in this year. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but just a few years, it hasn't been. Yeah, just shortly, long. because it's only been just under two years that I became a member. Right. And that was in March, uh, whenever the first membership class was in 21, because there weren't any at the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that this prayer invitation from Heritage came mm -hmm. to me. I think it's just so powerful to know that our pastors put prayer, a prayer priority, even in their staff meetings and what's going on with the staff. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yeah, it's it huge. is. It it's really important. Is. I feel like it's important for someone to be praying for the team, you know, right. you you see pastors and you think there's nothing beyond that, but who prays for them? Like, they need somebody to pray for them, too. And Yeah, that's so true. It's, an, yeah, it's a good role to have. Um, so we're really thankful that you're here and you brought your gift. And that's kind of what we were going to circle our conversation around is about intercessory prayer, what that looks like in your life, um, how God has led you through it. So mm -hmm. we just start kind of... And what where, it means. And what it means. Um, start kind of at the beginning. Where did... Where did your life with God start? Well, it started at, uh, of course, at home in my own uh, personal devotional time. When my uh, when Calvary started the prayer ministry, the 24-hour prayer ministry, I think that was in 1995, uh, that's when it went public, so to speak. And that was a role that I, I had been, I had at, been asked to lead prayer when I was in Bible school. And before we came to Calvary, I was uh, also asked to lead prayer in the women's meetings. And I was so new to everything, I couldn't figure out why everywhere I went, people were asking me to lead prayer. And we were like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, uh, but when I stepped into that place and... Um, in the power tower, the prayer ministry at Calvary, I began to sense the things um, specifically in uh, leading prayer with others. And that's when I would be taught by the Holy Spirit when I would get in my car after a two-hour prayer session with some other ladies, and I would begin to get instructions from him. Like, and and it and I began to see it clearly. And then the the it's fun. It's really fun. When you're in the place of your gifting and your anointing, it is really fun. And it would begin to be lots of fun to grow and be really sensitive to that uh, leading the, and teaching of the Holy Spirit. So it began to grow and grow and grow. Eventually, uh, I did that for 18 and a half years. In the last three years... You did 24-hour prayer assignment for 18 and a half years. Yes. The last three years of those 18 and a half years, I took a second one because the, it was just... The fire was just burning hotter. That's all I can say. It's just right where I wanted to be. Right. You were walking out the gift on your life. Yes. How does one become like a prayer warrior though? Like where do where, where does that where does that come from? Is like where does that fire even begin to spark? All of us are called to pray. It, which means we're called into a relationship, a 
a love relationship with him. And, uh, and then some of us have an, a, a calling to be an intercessor, which is also stepping into a, a broader place and a way of praying for others as well. And so there's all kinds of discoveries along the way. And uh, so that's what surprised me about my own walk when uh, some doors opened and I was going like, well, why? Because <laughs> I hadn't really discovered that about myself. Yeah. But uh, so one thing just kind of led to another. And as far as like stepping into the prayer ministry at Calvary, when they asked me, now, now keep in mind, I'm coming out of walking away from God. Okay, so the growth began to come fairly rapidly, and I could, I could feel it. And it was exciting because it was what I wanted. So there were a lot of things that I just learned at home and just lessons that would, the Holy Spirit would teach me. Some of it was in talking to the kids, being a mom. Some of it was just simply as a prayer. And... Uh, and I began to see some cycles of growth. When a cycle of growth reached its full capacity, this is what I experienced. The fruit that was there was then harvested. I don't know if this is going to make I mean, make that makes sense. I don't know if yeah. this is going to make sense. All right, now yeah, I'm following. I'm fruitless. That makes sense if it's all mm -hmm. harvested. Yep. All right. Where does that place you as a prayer? It, almost, it places you back in a place of teach me. In other words, he's going to take where you were and then begin to start a new growth. Mm -hmm. Like a new cycle. A new cycle. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I began to experience that over and over and over and over. And it was regular. Now, I didn't like the new cycle of growth because it's like, for instance, when, when that fruit is all full, you're walking in the fruit of the Spirit. You're walking in a place of victory that... that you have grown into, and then all of a sudden the fruit's removed and you get to start again. And it's like, oh, gosh. And uh, But I got comfortable in seeing these growth cycles come and come and come. Mm -hmm. I think I've experienced that in my walk with the Lord, too. I don't know, Andy, maybe yeah. you have, too. Yeah. Just like you get to a point and then... Um, I guess I never saw it as a harvest. I know that's, I was thinking like reaching new levels. You're at, you know, like, yeah, that, we often it, describe it like that. Yeah. But that um, makes sense. Like well, it's harvested. Yeah. Yeah. The first time it happened to me, I was just confounded. It was like, where'd you go? Holy spirit. Where are you? Where, right. Where'd you go? Okay. Then that, and with his teaching me, and at this point I, I'm feeling on my own, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. It just, felt like I was by myself. Yeah. But he began to teach me again, sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed. Do what you learned the first mm -hmm. time, which was sowing the seed. Mm -hmm. went, All right. So here comes, that's how you get a harvest. No, that's good because it's like you eat your harvest and then you have to sow again or you're going to go hungry. So you have to keep sowing. Yeah, yeah. keep sowing, I, keep sowing, yeah. keep sowing, and the harvest begins to come. Yeah, I mean, that, that just brings so much clarity in just looking back at like, the times the Lord has taken me through different things and I get somewhere and I'm like, I feel like I'm firing on all cylinders right now. Yeah. And then like a month later, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. I like, like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and spiritually what speaking, what happened yeah. to those what cylinders? Happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the motor is frozen. Yes. Yes. And so that makes, that just brings a lot of clarity. But you also mentioned that you had like fallen a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so what was that like? Your, your, Whenever you weren't following God, that experience. Oh, I did a great job of it. You know, <laughs> I'm all in. You're uh, a champion. <laughs> I'm all in. Okay, so if I walk away, I'm all in. All right, that's the dumbest thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And so that's why uh, I had scales dropping off my eyes experience. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a real encounter. And, and it was in my kitchen, and I've never forgotten it or anything like that. So I was having this conversation with my sister, and that's when she told me, she said, Carol, I just want to share with you how much God loves you. And my hardened ears just went, yeah, uh-huh. And I hung up the phone, and just a few steps, literally right after she said that, I was standing in the, right in the middle of my kitchen, and the scales dropped off. Okay, when that happens, you go to your knees. 
because you can see clearly mm-hmm. where you were blind, now you see. Then I headed toward God and never looked, ever looked back, ever. I found out that Calvary had a Bible school. I was just all in on it. It was just everything. I, I, I devoured everything. Mm-hmm. I would devour the Bible. I would read other books, and, and the prayer life began to grow. And uh, again, it was never looking back. Not What was that like never. for your family? To see you go through, <laughs> like you go through years of not fo- like five years of not following God, and now you're all in, and like you're all in. Okay, what is that like? For okay, your the family? good part was this: they were relatively young. Now, had they been teenagers, they'd be going, "Mom, confused, yeah, like what's going on? <laughs> what?" <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, being relatively young, like the youngest one may- was maybe seventh grade, sixth grade at the time. So it was very easy, and all of a sudden, they did notice a difference in mom. Mm-hmm. And what was interesting is that it began to change what I permitted them to watch on TV, and I, they would be coming down the hallway, and I would stop, and then I, we would have like a little Bible lesson or something like that. <laughs> in the hallway? <laughs> yes. Okay. They would. <laughs> a drive-by Bible lesson? <laughs> there you go. And sometimes they would say, Mom, you just need to teach. You need to teach. And... uh you know, but I was constantly, as one of my friends would say, speaking into their lives because mm-hmm. it was just an overflow. And at the same time, you know, you're considering your responsibility as a mom to lead your children uh, in the ways that they should go. Well, I can't help but look back and remember when I didn't. Looking back as your kids have grown... Do you see a lot of fruit from that time and everything that you imparted into your your home and your lifestyle? And yes, then- and the, the 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 blessing was is they just they just followed me exactly where I went. Uh, we were all in with youth group, and uh, they each had their own um, walk with God. As a as a teacher, I began to see in my students. I taught high school, so I had freshmen through seniors, and I noticed in a lot of them that between the sophomore and the junior year was a year of big commitment, where at the end of their sophomore year, you know, uh, they're often following in the footsteps of mom and dad, but then they come to a place where they own it, Mm -hmm. and I saw frequently where that happened between the sophomore, end of the sophomore year and the beginning of the junior year. And where my kids stepped into that, I don't really know. All I know is that they stepped into their own walk with God. And was I still in a significant place? Yes, because in Ephesians it says, watch and pray. So I was always watching them and then praying and, you know, speaking into their lives as if needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, they probably thought mom took advantage of that. (laughs) I probably did. How long did you teach? It was about... um, Ten and a half years. Mm-hmm. My uh, Calvary had a full Christian academy, uh, K through twelve. That all your kids went through? No, none of them did. Oh, they didn't. They didn't attend. You just taught, right? And uh, uh, the younger two, my oldest one, got to go to a, a Christian, a different Christian school in her senior year. Mm-hmm. Our finances changed, and so the two younger ones. Uh, bless their hearts, they were stuck in public school. <laughs> um, but with the the life that we were living, uh, all in with God and and all in with our church and everything like that, it it was okay. Mm-hmm. Um, David now says, David, my son, who is uh, an evangelist and stepping into the role of a pastor. He looked back on those years, and he would say, he said, all right, if if I do it again, I would go to a bank and borrow the money and get myself out of public school and get myself to pay for my own (laughs) private school. (laughs) But he did, but he obviously did okay. I mean, yeah, evangelist now, he, public school did not hurt him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it was an uncomfortable place for him to walk through because he was, uh, he was really on fire. Yeah. And, uh, but yes. It's neat that the home life literally set the standard for their 
life, even at a young age. Mm-hmm. So even if you're, if your kids have been in public school, like if yeah. that, um, what's the word? If that altar is in the home, that yes. time with the Lord that you guys as a family spent, I'm sure praying together as a family, but also investing in them, like this is your prayer life. Yeah. That carried them through some of those tougher seasons. Yes, yes it did. And you made a really good point. It, it has to be in the home. Uh, you can't leave it to, if your kids are in a place of being able to be in a Christian academy, uh, high school, you can't leave it to them. Mm-hmm. Sure. You can't leave it to the youth group in your church, your pastor. You can't do that. Now, we had all of those things. We didn't have the Christian school working for us because they were in the public schools. But, uh, yes, that fire needs to be in the home. I had one student that uh, when he was praying in class, I knew I had not taught him. He didn't learn that from me. And so I asked him, I went to uh, his mom, and I said, where did he learn to pray? I said, because I knew he hadn't gotten it in my class. He came with it Mm -hmm. into my class, and it just stood out. I said, where did he learn that? And she said, we pray at home all the time. And I was like, there it is. There ding, it was. Ding, ding, ding. There it was right there. And now with the, some of the other students, I began to, uh, I could begin to see the gaps in their lives. And I asked one student one time to tell me about his prayer life. And it was just the two of us. And he said, well, basically it came down to he would, if he was leaving my class and going to his history class that had a test, he would pray from my class to his class. And asking God to help him with his history test. I also discovered they prayed primarily about their sport practices and their games. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very narrow prayer life. I began to go to the book, Prayers That Avail Much. I edited some of them to fit more of the high school way that they would talk and think. And I began to hand it out to them and give them prayers to pray. Then I began to require them to pray for a grade. Now, this was a huge step, and it was a step that wasn't, didn't, it had opposition coming from parents uh, because I, they were required to do it for a grade. I like, I just got like really sweaty whenever you said that, like praying for a grade, like. (laughs) Yeah, see, that's my leverage because I knew that if it was left to them, what would most of them do? That I had teenagers. I knew. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I put the grade on it, yes, they would have to do it. If, if, that, if I gave them and I realized, I thought, okay, here's, the, here's one of the big gaps. They don't have the language. They don't mm-hmm. know the language of prayer. How do I give them the language of prayer? So I went to the prayers that avail much, and I saw the prayers that would that fit what they needed, and it began to just put the words in their mouth. So mm-hmm. they didn't have to. They didn't have to sit like I did at hours at home in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which is what most teenagers aren't going to do. Right. The ones who had a call on their life, would they probably have done it? Yes. But the, the others, left to themselves, probably not. Mm-hmm. And so, but it gave them the language. And so all, if, if you took the prayer and just read it, you succeeded in getting your grade. Now, so... Are they motivated by that? Yes. But is there something deeper going on? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. an incorruptible seed. I mean, they, you sowed the yes. word in prayer into them, whether they yeah. knew it or not. It's like giving a kid a vitamin, a gummy vitamin. Like, they're going to eat the gummy vitamin because it's a gummy. <laughs> yes. But they get, yeah. they get the fruit. <laughs> so they're that's, happy a good, get, that's good. <laughs> they're happy to get the gummy. Yeah. So they fulfilled an assignment it, in their eyes. They don't realize at that time what they're learning. Mm-hmm. But they're putting the word in their mouth and they're they're speaking it. So uh, that was a a really explorative time because there were no other teachers that would require that as a grade. And a few years down the road, my principal came back. She would go to the 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 teacher school, so whatever it was they'd send them to and, you know, like at ORU. 
And she came back one time and said, Carol, she said, I just want you to know that the depth that we have here in our classes that no one else is walking in. And then the other thing was is that we prayed in class. I would turn the lights out. I would turn the music on, and we would begin to pray in class. And I freely would speak in tongues. The, the, the spirit-filled atmosphere doesn't necessarily come into a cl- Christian classroom mm-hmm. in a high school. But in mine, it did. Mm-hmm. A number of years after this, some of the students would get into their 20s, I would hear back from them and say, thank you for teaching me to pray. Thank you for teaching me to pray. Thank you. Because that's when they begin to own it for themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the, all of the training. The maturity, that harvest. The maturity, they, yeah. yeah. The harvest of it began to show up. So That's powerful. That's powerful. I am I'm curious to why parents bucked that and had a hard time with that. One uh, mom, and she was a very godly woman too, and she went to see the principal and had a issue with it, you know, making them to pray for a grade. Well, I understood that my that the uh, the leverage that I had as a teacher would get them to the place of prayer. Then I began to understand because of you know her questioning about it and everything. I un- you, you you begin to understand. Well, all right. Here's the here's the higher way to see it. If I could get them to the place of prayer, then what happened there was between them and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. But if I could get them there and their heart was open at all, then the Holy Spirit would would move. He's the teacher, mm-hmm. and he's the teacher within them. I'm the teacher at school, mm-hmm. but he's the teacher within them, and he knows how to. T- Teach them in the way that really works. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of limited in what I can do in a classroom, but the Holy Spirit has no limits. And so uh, that's what I trusted was happening. So That's awesome. Uh, I think you do everything 100%, including winning baking championships. (laughs) So one of your, (laughs) my earliest uh, introductions to you was, I can't remember which year it was, 2020? It was, it was, no, it was 2021 yeah, when, it was 2021. when you and Riley won the baking champion. So have you always been competitive like that? Like that's my, that's my first she introduction. She said she goes all in. All in. She's not playing around. Yes. I played tennis for a while and that I, I did that when I was in my away from God years and began to discover the competitiveness. And so, yes, uh, now I understand that the competitiveness, you know, it, it can become very carnal. Oh, mm-hmm. like in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do it for but me. The, mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean it's not from God. But here's, yeah. the, here's, the, here's the other way of seeing it. If you see somebody that's running a race that's fast and they're faster than you, the competitiveness wants you to get where they are as well. All right, that's a healthy side of competitiveness. And because you see something in someone and you want to, you want to run where they're running. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it has a, has a carnal side, but it also has a very healthy side. Yeah. And a very yummy side. What? Yes. What? I wasn't here that year. Uh, really? 2021. I was on vacation. Yeah, I missed that year. Uh, what did you bake? What won? What was it? I don't know what it was. It was your black bottom cupcakes. I remember oh, yes. exactly what it was. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I have the, this recipe for black bottom cupcakes, and I've never had it anywhere I've gone, you know, to a home group or anything like that. And so I knew that's what I was going to bake, and so I brought that, and it won the dessert uh, category. That's what, that's what she brought to the Christmas party. I took, like, le- three to go. I did. I took so them home. <laughs> they were so good. Okay, I know exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they were so good. I took some home. That year, I happened to get asked to be a judge for the desserts, oh, wow. and I was, and so I, I, I mean, those are good. Cup, that's a, that's like you should make that every day. <laughs> that's baking a as a winner in life. <laughs> Black bottom cupcakes. I love it. I love cupcakes. I love baking too. Well, you do a fabulous. So, what else do you cook or bake? Uh, I've tried to retire from that. <laughs> Just bring it back to win a championship. Yeah, Anytime that's all. there's a competition. No <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's fine. That's awesome. So, how did you find Heritage? Uh, that was a very good question. 
we uh, reached a point at Calvary where we uh, left for a few years and went to another church, and uh, a, an awesome church. But the thing about Calvary is I knew he had planted us there, and it was our home. So to leave, I, I actually grieved in my heart for months, but it was necessary. But at this other wonderful church, I never had the home feel. At the end of 2019, Calvary was being sold to Mercy Culture. Mm-hmm. At that time, my son David and Riley left. They came straight here. And I asked him, I said, why didn't you go visit, 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 visit? Yeah. Why did you just come right here? And in his, some of his evangelistic outreaches, he had met Pastor Justin and had conversations with him. So he knew what kind of a man he was. Mm-hmm. He came straight here. And I went, okay. So at that time, uh, the churches were closed down because of COVID, Mm -hmm. and the church where we were was still closed down. I reached a point like, I'm done. I have to get in a church. And so then I had the conversation with David, and he said, this is why they came here. So we came here. And when we came here, uh, that was like, I think the end of September or so, something like that in 2020. And when I came, I heard the words in my heart, home, home. Now, I know what it's like to be in a home church to be planted there specifically by God. It's different from attending. That's true. Mm -hmm. So when you hear it twice, home, home, I felt like I was in this home for, you know, forever. And then the next time I came, I felt felt the stirring of the Holy Spirit right here. Well, it had been years since I had that. Now, it doesn't mean that I... I mean, that was also the voice of the Spirit speaking in that stirring right there. And that was settled. I've heard that before. I think it was on Danny's podcast where he said he heard the word home too. I think it's nice that people relate heritage to home because that's, I think if you attend heritage, everyone kind of has that feeling that it's, it's, it does feel like a home. It doesn't yes. feel just like, I mean, I've been to several different oh, yeah. churches before and it has, and it's not just because my parents are the, that's not sure. what it is. That's not why it feels like home. It feels like home because of the other people that are in it, like yeah. the environment and like what God does through the people and just the yes. community. And that's a good word is yeah. the community. It does yeah. feel like a home. And it's like, you just kind of snapped into place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was our experience too. We moved from Oregon to here and we tried out, we went, we visited several churches in the area um, and we came to this one. It happened to be one of the anniversary services. Fun. It was like, like I'm like, they're serving turkey legs in the parking lot after church. Where <laughs> am I? What is this place? Um, but there was an immediate feeling of home. There was mm-hmm. like, like this is where we belong. And I was in search of home and it was, it was mm-hmm. heritage that, that the Lord said, this is home. Mm -hmm. So it didn't take us long to get plugged in either. We only visited a few other churches, but we knew when we stepped foot and the next time we came, it was like, no, this is where we belong. Yeah. Yeah. So where God's planning us. Yeah. Um, What would you say to somebody? Is there going to be people who listen to this, who are at the very beginning of their stages or even in the journey of understanding and walking in intercessory prayer at a, at a greater degree, what kind of encouragement could you give somebody who's like in the journey, walking it out? Get hungry. The, one of the things that I learned early on, and of course, anything that I've learned, I've learned by the Spirit of God. And one thing I have said countless times is teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. And there's, I was thinking about that this morning. There's, there's a hunger for a relationship with God that we have. In the early 90s, the Holy Spirit taught me to pray this. Say, I love you, I need you, and I want you. And I think that one, I want you, is the one that we need to come to the place and explore. I want you. We often, 
our humanity, our human self has needs, and we ask based on that. And I've heard people say, you know, we shouldn't come and ask that. Well, I, ha- I disagree with that because if, if you break your leg and then you have needs, that needs to be attended to. Mm-hmm. God's not intimidated by that. And, and he understands growth. But I began to say those things constantly to God. I love you. I need you. I want you. <clears throat> now, my level of saying those things now is different from when I started because there's been a lot of growth. The I want you is... Uh, comes a lot based on Philippians 3.10, for my determined purpose is to know you. Because that I may progressively come to know in, you know, in intimacy, uh, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. I want you. I want you. So there's that development as a prayer and, and that is to want the heart of God. But there's another hunger that comes out of that that can't be satisfied until you step into that, and that is to be used of God. And there are two hungers like that basically coincide together, mm-hmm. which is why he placed me here as there was a hunger to be used of God. And, but the hunger that to know him is the one that, that's a hunger that you've got to protect You have got to keep the fire inside of you burning, and uh, these two hungers work together. I don't even remember your original question now. (laughs) Just encouragement to those that are on the journey, that are learning, that are are hungry and want to go to the next level in their prayer life. Yeah. Um, So that that answered my question. I look back on it now, and I've journaled these things, but I've had encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter, and most of these have been home, at home, sitting in my prayer chair. And one of the things that, one of the fun ways was, uh, it's in 2 Corinthians, where, either chapter 4 or 10, but it's talking about uh, exploring and examining in the realm of the Spirit, and it I love that word exploring because that's what the, where the Holy Spirit takes us in exploring new realms of the Spirit that we have never stepped into before. And I remember when I was teaching the high school students, I said, the Holy Spirit knows how to thrill the heart of a teenager. Well, he knows how to th- thrill the heart of a grandmommy. At the time, <laughs> I wasn't a grandmommy, you know, and, but he knows how to thrill our hearts and it's that hunger and that desire for him in knowing him, the intimacy level with him that opens up the doors that haven't been opened before. Mm-hmm. And uh, the encounters that you have with him. Like there was one particular time I was having a, a relational issue with a family member, and these this wasn't my children. Uh, or my husband, so just to kind of clarify <laughs> So as that. you're listening, children <laughs> so, and husband. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just so you know. Not you. And, uh, and the thing was this, is that God responded to me like my most intimate friend. Mm-hmm. And I was at home in my prayer chair, and there was a time where he came and he stood right next to me, knowing I was how I was feeling about what had just happened. And this is what he said. He said, I came after you. Wow. I came after you. All right. Now that takes me all the way back to the beginning of my beginning. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's a word where when you hear him say that to you, I came after you. And it's, well, okay, that has a lot bigger application mm-hmm. than just where my hurt feelings were at that right. time like that and so there are times that he'll say these big magnificent like life-changing things to you that begin to really alter how you your perceptions of life and the things that you're walking through it changes your viewpoint the viewpoint he wants us to have is seated with him in heavenly places where we live from heaven to earth not from heaven not from earth to heaven yeah 
and those will come you begin to see it in the word because it's written there, but then he wants you to encounter it in person. He wants you to have it experientially. Mm -hmm. It's It's powerful. Yeah. Please. When, when I was in the prayer tower at, at Calvary, I was with um, other ladies that like to pray as I did. We were loud. I was very comfortable being loud. I have I have a friend, uh, the husband of a dear friend of mine, who used to say, "Carol thinks that Satan is deaf." It's <laughs> amazing. I always responded, "He is." <laughs> and but I could liken it to this: I drive a Corvette. I drove a Corvette here. You can drive that Corvette fast. Mm-hmm. That's fun. <laughs> All right. My my prayer experiences in that prayer ministry was like in the fast lane. We would put the pedal to the metal and we were all out and we were loud. We had quietness as well. But there was a lot like that. And I recently got with a group of friends that their prayer atmosphere was quieter. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here going like, I don't get it. I don't get it. It was like putting a Corvette at 30 miles an hour. And I'm going... We're made to go 100. Right. <laughs> but what I learned was to dial it down and pray. And, and, I, and, and that is not inferior in any degree. But what it taught me was a new expression of prayer. Mm-hmm. And it forced a growth that was uncomfortable a lot of the times. Because I would get in the car and drive home and go, why am I there? Why? Why? Do you think you were there for them also to help them go to the next level? It's hard to go from zero to 60 yes. in yeah. a prayer life. So slowing yes. down to their, for lack of a better word, slowing down to their speed may have helped them finally shift gears. Well, we come, I realize it took me a long time to realize this. All of these ladies are just leaders within themselves. We begin to really follow somebody when we have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes a while to really know somebody. And I realized about a year ago, Tanya, I had that very thought. I went, all right, this now I'm in a position to begin to move things into a, 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 a degree of freedom that they haven't experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I can't just take the throttle and move it as I want it. I have to be led by the spirit like that. But I realize that um, that I am truly grateful that I learned how to pray a different way. So uh, we never stop learning. Teach me to pray is always valid. Teach me to pray. Mm-hmm. Teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Well, you, I, I think it's interesting your terminology because you know I think a lot of people think oh it's just prayer if you just pray like you don't need to learn how to pray or anything but funny on my I was filling out my planner this morning and at the beginning of my planner it had like goals and things that you want to accomplish and so I was thinking and just like filling it out this morning and one of them was to learn to pray and to pray harder that was literally something I wrote on my planner this morning and I think people just don't know how how, how do you learn to pray? How do you learn? How does that something you learn to do when for so like, I mean, for me for so long, I've just thought you just, just it's just, you just talk yeah. to God like that. Isn't that what you do? But there is a lot more. If you want to go to other levels in your prayer mm-hmm. life, then you do have to learn specific skills on how to get there and how to. And I, I just think everything you're saying, it's very interesting because this is things that I've thought of like very recently well what's really neat is the holy spirit is our guide Mm -hmm. um back when kelly lived in she's my oldest daughter she lived in mexico as a missionary she and i went to a place maybe an hour and a half from where she lived in ciudad victoria and we wanted to go down 
uh, on a rafting trip that she had heard about. Now, this is kind of wild. Here we have two women off on their own, and this was before all the cartel stuff was Mm -hmm. surfacing. Now, was it there? Yes. That's the scary part when you realize how much it was there, but we just (laughs) didn't didn't know. know. So we're driving in the country. Here's a 15-year-old on the side of the road. Kelly rolls the window down and asks him about this rafting. And so we hired him as our guide. He was going to take us... Yeah, that's not tri- uh, yeah. <laughs> scary. So at all. trusting. Yeah. Now she she speaks fluent Spanish. Mm-hmm. I have almost nothing. So <laughs> anyway, we get in his raft and he rows us up the river to these amazing waterfalls and then we come back. Now he's a guide and here's what the Holy Spirit does. He'll take you to places you want to go, but you don't know how to get there. So that's why we say, Holy Spirit, teach me to pray. Mm-hmm. Uh, teach me. And if there's a specific way that you want to grow in, you can say that. Like, for instance, the last couple of days, one of the things I've I've realized, and this is the first time I've ever said, I said, teach me strategy in prayer. Mm -hmm. And so we have this guide who lives inside of us, and he'll take you to places that you want to go. Mm -hmm. And and like, for instance, over the, I realized over the last six weeks, I've had a cry in my heart, and I realized how many times quietly, and it was coming out, like, Lord, use me. I want, I want to be used of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that just snapped into place. Yeah. In a greater way, just yesterday. Because uh, he hears the cry, Mm -hmm. and he answers it. Because he put the cry in your heart. Right. He loves it when you express that. Expression comes from him. And uh, he loves it. That's good. Gosh, that's so good. It's just uh, bringing back all of these memories along my walk when um, I'm just seeing God be intentional with who he put me around to help me in prayer. I can remember... When I was very first saved, I had a friend and her dad was one of the high school teachers and they were spirit filled Christians, but she would invite me. They would do these crazy things in my mind. They were crazy, but they would just go to the park and they'd set a sign out that said like 4 p.m. or something. And they would do like a human video and minister to the people at the park and pray with them. I was like, why would you do that? Like, you're not even like, like it was, it was so foreign to me. So I go over and she's like, we just need somebody to start the music and stop it at this right time. So they were practicing their little thing. I was a baby Christian. One of the girls had had a need. And so they, and they just stopped practice and they just began to pray in the Holy Ghost and pray over her. And they spoke words over her. And I was there and I was like just on this side of spirit filled, like had no idea what I was doing. And I watched my friend like get to the heart of the father and pray something out over her friend that, uh, that healed that piece that she was just like, I mean, she got up and they, they were able to finish. And then we were at the park. She got a minister. I mean, it was, it, blew, it just really blew me away that God used my friend, but in prayer to meet mm-hmm. that girl's mm-hmm. need mm-hmm. and why I was there. I have, you know, I had no idea why I was even involved with what my friend was doing. Um, but it was a moment when I said, oh, I want to know how to do that. Yes. I want to hit your heart. Yes. Not for me. Like, I want to know how to pray better. Yes. I mean, I don't even understand this prayer language thing at the time. I didn't. But I want to know how to, like, pray and get results. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yes. In a real time. Like, real yeah. time. It wasn't like they were at a church. This was my whole, all my thinking at, like, 20. They're not at a church pastor's not leading this prayer. Like, yeah. like this is like legit. This is how God moves. Yeah. And, uh, and just thinking about like all the steps along on how God put pe- puts people in your path to help you just like he is with those ladies that you're praying with that yes. you have to go back to 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Just to, they, my friends mm-hmm. had to do that. They had no idea. Well, after praying in the power tower, as long as I did with the ladies and it, and it was a, again, we had a, a, a goal praying for the United States and all, all of that. Um, uh, I, uh, encountered another woman of prayer, not personally, like we're sitting here or anything. I was never, um, uh, I got to hear her in person one time, but she would constantly say, you know, how she would just pray throughout the day and just pray over or pray out stuff or just pray, just like, Lord, touch my friend, and then like this. Okay, that's not something I knew how to do because 
I was full on when I stepped into that two-hour shift, and that was my wheelhouse, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, but over the and and I couldn't relate, and I was and and then at the same time, you know, you think, well, that's not very effective. Now, this woman was the <laughs> minister of prayer over this large church. Okay, for me to say that, okay, that's like, how dumb can you be? But, <laughs> but I was, so I'm just saying. But over the last few years, that aspect of my prayer life has grown too. Yeah. I have stepped into a place where I feel comfortable just saying, just praying just a sentence or two about someone and then... You know, going back to whatever you're doing, mm-hmm. and then just throughout the day, like that. That's a different type of intercessory prayer. Mm-hmm. So there's growth good. all along. That's good. So our motto at Heritage is making winners in life. So we always ask this question to all of our guests. What does that mean to you, making winners in life? Well, as far as prayer goes, I would say that to be a winner in life is to pursue the love relationship with God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Never change course. And then out of that flows the desires to... I saw this just recently about Jack Hayford's life who just transitioned to heaven. I saw that. And he... There were two places to live, from the inner court or the outer court. To pursue the love relationship with God is to live within that inner court. And in that, we're positioned to be influencers, changers. We, we have the, uh, the heart and the mind to hear and to receive and to do the will of God. Thank you listeners so much for joining us. Carol King is such a gift to our church family. And even if you don't see her or talk to her all the time, I'm sure you are feeling what she's praying over this house and beyond. If you wanna know more about how she grew in her prayer life, just ask her the next time you see her and we will see you next week for Winning Conversations.